Hello and welcome to On Your Screen, a podcast about digital moving image culture. Hosted by Will DiGravio, who thought it would be fun to introduce the show this way. I am a voiceover generator included with Adobe Audition. Today's episode is dedicated to a new book by Francesca Coppa, called Vidding, A History, which is a free, open access book from the University of Michigan Press. Will, who as he types this is realizing this may be easier than recording intros in the future, encourages you to learn more about the show and Francesca's book via the podcast's website, www.thevideoessay.com. You can also follow the show on Twitter, at The Video Essay, subscribe on YouTube, and support the show on Patreon. Enjoy the show exclamation point. Now I'm very pleased to be joined by Francesca Coppa, uh, who is a professor at Muhlenberg College, whose work runs a wide range uh, of topics, which uh, we'll get into in a second, um, and who's the author of a fantastic new book called Vidding uh, a History. Uh, Francesca, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Welcome to On Your Screen. Oh, I'm so pleased to be here. Thank you for having me. Pleasure's all mine. And could you just please give us a brief introduction to who you are, your background, um, and your scholarly interests, which I, I loved reading, um, the, the wide range of work that you've done, especially because even though I'm in this space now, I think I first, as an undergrad, decided I need to major in the humanities after reading The Importance of Being Earnest, which is like my favorite work. And so you wrote an introduction to a, a version of that. So I'm like, oh my God, we, we could have a whole conversation about all these other things I want to pick your brain about. But um, the, the focus today is bidding. So if you could take us up to how you first got involved in bidding, because it's something you discuss um, in the book. Um, and it's, it's a really great story that I'd be eager for the, the listeners to hear. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, yeah. I mean, my background is in dramatic literature, right? In, in, in theater, a sort of English theater. Um, and as you're you know alluding, right, I am a, an Oscar Wilde scholar. I'm you know, sort of at, at my core. But, you know, the interesting thing about drama is that drama is a weird literary form because it's essentially always incomplete. <laughs> drama requires actors and directors and designers to kind of come and make it whole, right? And in fact, as I, you know, when I teach drama, I'm always telling students, like, it's not just what's on the page. You have to remember, like, there might be other people in the room who are not saying anything, who are affecting the meaning of that moment. Mm-hmm. But it has a right. kind of incompleteness, or, or, or rather to say, overtly has an incompleteness. Um, other, I would say, you know, novels do too, in that when you read a novel, you kind of flesh it out, right? But, but theater is sort of obviously incomplete. And I think because of that sort of orientation towards theater. I was earlier prepared to do what we now call participatory culture, right? Which was a place where, you know, people sort of finish or change or remix or add to or interpret um, existing works. And so in an odd way, a lot of the work that I do in fan culture is really about seeing um, fan culture as a kind of theater where fans are the directors, designers, actors, rewriters, script doctors who are taking like a script, except instead of the importance of being earnest, the script could be a Marvel movie, right? right? And it's like, okay, that's great. Now let's do a production of it. And here's how I'm going to design it. And here's what I'm going to make of it. And we're going to cut these scenes and we're going to add this stuff. And so that for me is the link between mm. my, you know, my drama background and my fan studies interest. Uh, and in fact, some of my earliest work was really about trying to explain to people that kind of what we call transformative works, works like fan fiction, fan art, vidding. Um, we're not strange, but we're on a perfect kind of continuity, right? With other works that that need to be kind of rewritten, reproduced, reactivated, reimagined, right? You know, Ian McKellen does Richard III in a kind of, you know, Nazi fascist regime. And everybody goes, wow, how, how interesting, right? In fandom, we do that. And we call that an alternate universe, <laughs> right? Or <laughs> right. Sort of re- we're going to redo the story and change the setting and, you know, update it. Uh, and so, in fact, a lot of the kinds of things you've seen done with Shakespeare, you see done by fans. Um, mm. And my first kind of fan studies book was called The Fan Fiction Reader. And I was really looking at how fan fiction is about reimagining um, essentially kind of taking, you know, pop, pop, mostly popular cultural stories, but lots of different kinds of stories as a kind of script to be redone and reimagined and turned inside out. And this book, Vidding a History, is looking at vidding, which is doing that with the kind of film text itself, right? So if fan fiction rewrites stories using text, um, vidding 
is about re-editing the archive of footage to um, draw out meanings, make new meanings, tell new stories, um, change the story, or often just to sort of change the emotional content. Um, and that, that's how I got here <laughs> to writing uh, this book, which is called Bidding a History. I love how you lay it out. And I think, you know, just from like kind of the student perspective, because it wasn't that long that I was a student, I felt like I always had an interest in film, but in high school or whatever, we really only read novels or, or, or whatever. And then I found drama was kind of this really great way to this kind of bridge between the two because you have to think about the collaborative nature of it all um, and all the different forms that the text can take. So it, it makes complete sense. And I haven't, I never really thought of like thinking about like Shakespeare adaptations as the ultimate fan gesture, right? I guess Shakespeare has more fans out there than anyone, right? <laughs> no. And in fact, uh, you know, um, part of my biography, I should say as well. So, I, you know, I'm cross appointed in English and film studies, um, but I'm also a founder of an organization, one of the founders of an organization called the Organization for Transformative Works, uh, which is a nonprofit that's sort of devoted um, to, to pr preserve, well, first and foremost, to preserving fan works, but also to writing about them and ad advocating for them in the legal sphere and doing other things. But one of the arguments, you know, when we started up, uh, there was really um, a, a sense that fan works like fan fiction and vidding um, were, were inferior artworks. Uh, and you can see that I, I, you know, I've had a you know multi-decade <laughs> long fight to sort of say that that's actually right. really not true. But as you know, when people talked about the sort of inferiority of it, of, you know, well, why don't you just have your own ideas or such and such? Um, or they would have a fear of it saying, oh, fan work is going to be bad for me. One of the arguments that we made, I think, fairly successfully is to say, actually, no, when people make fan works of your work, it helps you. And in fact, Shakespeare is Shakespeare because he has so many fans. Mm. And what I mean by that is Shakespeare continues to draw the best collaborators Right. He mm -hmm. has been dead for 400 years and the most talented people in the world want to collaborate and rewrite and remix and work with mm -hmm. Shakespeare. And that is what keeps him relevant. Not the text that you read in a book and not even I mean, right. I'd love to say it's colleges and universities. No, it's that the most talented people of the moment want to reimagine the work in creative new ways. You know, whether it's Julie Taymor or Ian McKellen or Tom Hiddleston or, you know, who, designers, directors or, or, or Denzel Washington and the new Macbeth. Right. All right. The most collaborative people of the day. And so to recognize that fandom does that, and in fact, it having a vibrant fandom is a sign of your meaningfulness in the culture at that moment. And that, in fact, the more people who are rewriting you, reengaging you, reworking you, it's like, or, or to you know, switch metaphors, uh, it's like song covers, you know? Right. Um, the, the Beatles are the Beatles because they're great, but the Beatles are often, are hugely covered, right? I mean, people want to sing those songs and they want to sing them professionally, but they also just want to sing them in the shower, you know? And 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 if people want to sing your song, that's how you know you're a, you know, a significant artist. And when people stop singing your song, right, it, it doesn't mean you're bad, but it may mean your moment is past. Absolutely. And the Beatles figure as an important group in, in your book, which perhaps we'll get to later, and Paul McCartney as an avant-garde filmmaker. Um, yes. I'll tell you, <laughs> just, just to say, yeah, we, yeah, we, yeah. we can talk about it when you're ready, but there is way more Paul McCartney in this book than I anticipated when I started <laughs> writing it. But I kept running into Paul McCartney uh, behind every corner, which was very unexpected. Yeah, no, I had been, not been exposed to any of that history, so it was, it was really fun and interesting to read. But I want to just, uh, you know, the point of this podcast is to kind of kind of serve as a guide to the listener who is just we are overwhelmed by sounds and images online and different type aspects of remix culture in general. So my question to you is a very basic one, which is what is a vid? And I would also be curious um, if in your answer you could describe what maybe is not a vid or are there similar things that we may encounter on our screens or at a conference or something that is similar to a vid? Um, could you just walk us through what makes a vid in your eyes? <laughs> I recognize that, you know, when writing this book, I've sort of set myself up in a way to be the vidding police, which was never <laughs> actually my intention, except to say that it was a little bit my intention in that, first of all, one of the things that I want to say is that something like vidding is relatively modern in that for the vast, you know, obviously moving images are already modern is a hundred years old. And that's my English hat talking, right? It's not like text, which is two, you know, 2000 year <laughs> old literary tradition. Right. You know, we've only really had film for a hundred and plus years, but regular people did not have access to footage. And to the extent to which vidding is a remix art, it requires regular people to have access to footage. Um, and vidding is, a, in my view, a relatively specific form developed by women where footage from popular, generally popular culture, but TV and movies 
um, often beloved TV and movies that were the subject of a fandom, was recut to pop music to do any number of things, but often, uh, in fact, to kind of either draw out a reading, an interpretation, to make something visible. And in that way, I know you have an interest in videographic criticism, but it's in that it's in that way that there's a that videographic criticism is now seen to be kind of a, a next door art, right? Where you you cut together the footage to emphasize a pattern or to make something visible that may not have been visible in the original. Um, mm. But because it's also musical, it is also about changing the emotional tone often of a scene or creating a kind of emotional reading that may be either present in the original text, but subsumed, or maybe was not pre- present in the original text that the person feels should have been present in the original text, right? Because right. music in many ways bypasses you know, the rational part of the brain, right? And the music makes you feel things. It's very persuasive. Um, And in fact, melodrama, right, is like music plus drama. Like, and that's, that's on some, right? And so the idea that, that music changes your understanding and how you see is essential to bidding. So to put those definitions together, what a, what a vid is, is a, is a you, and you may have seen this, I say this in the book, like you may have been, you know, surfing, almost everybody has kind of stumbled on one, um, just randomly if you're not looking for them. But if you came across a music video that seemed to be featuring as footage, some TV or movie to a three or four minute pop song, you have seen a vid. <laughs> um, and it's, it's a much older now, in fact, There's lots of people who make vids because footage has become so widely available and because computers now feature as kind of their package, as part of the package, a sort of editing software. Um, But what's interesting about vidding is it used to be quite difficult to do, um, and it started as an analog form, and in that way has um, important continuities with experimental cinema and, and feminist early cinema of sort of the 60s, kind of DIY amateur filmmaking of the kind of 60s. Um, And so uh, has its roots in in an earlier time when mostly women fans made vids with slides and then with VHS uh, footage in the pre-digital age. Uh, And now that we have digital footage, obviously it's an exploding art form where it's it's, it's, it's much easier to do. Um, But at the same time, the artistic game is up because now you have all these amazing visual tools you can cut and edit and splice and change color and, you know, create scenes that never existed and, you know, do, do all the kind of digital toolbox uh, stuff. Mm. So it's, it's also, it's easier to do in the most basic form, but the art form has gotten also tremendously advanced. Yes. I definitely want to return to technology in a minute because it's such a, an important part of your book, but I want to also return to kind of a, a more aesthetic approach and, and the, the experience that Vitting tries to convey. Um, and we, you mentioned Marvel, and I see you have a Captain America shield behind you. And, you know, so it seems so much of online film discourse today on Twitter or wherever, um, and even the New York Times with Martin Scorsese writing op-eds and, and things like that, is that films that make use of, you know, special effects, these big blockbusters, or, you know, is it cinema, is it not? We don't need to litigate that here, but that's kind of the big debate these days. Um, but in your book, you write that, uh, and I'll, I'll quote here, quote, that fan will sit through any number of long CGI sequences for those few seconds seconds where characters interact or express a feeling, and that through vidding, they can, quote, distill that experience, cutting out the filler and drawing out meaning of the spectacle with song. And I think at that moment, you quote Pauline Kael's analysis of movie musicals, where she says, ah, I got to look at all this stuff and I like them, you know, but I got to get past it all to kind of really get at the heart of what's on screen. I I underlined this passage furiously, um, and I'm wondering if you could just walk us through how important is, is conveying experience the experience of watching uh, through vidding, and what are some common ways uh, that vidders do this? With again acknowledging that we can't cover a wide range of everything that can can go on in a vid, which is what makes everything so exciting, of course. So you know the the, the bit you're talking about in the book is a, a place where I make a kind of comparison to musicals, and musicals you know do often sort of stop for three or four minutes to let someone sing about how they feel, <laughs> right? <laughs> and it's which is lovely, right? The action doesn't you know when Maria is singing tonight tonight right (laughs) in some ways time kind of stops and you get feeling emotion catharsis you get to be with her in that feeling for the length of that song and as 
in, we'll stay with West Side Story since I just off the top of my head picked West Side Story, but pick your musical, right? I mean, we get to stop or, you know, if it's Julie Andrews twirling, you know, on the mountain, the hills are alive. We know how she feels for however long that song lasts in that moment. And of course, there is spectacle in the musical, right? I mean, there's the there's the Alps, right? Or there's, you know, a million uh, people dancing and twirling skirts, right? So there's spectacle, but we also stop to feel and think. Well, the Marvel movie or the blockbuster or the sci-fi or Star Wars, right, in many ways is the thing that now has taken the place of the musical in culture. It won't surprise you to know I also teach a course on the musical on film. I'm quite interested in this. Um, and as it used to be that the big kind of family friendly, let's all go out and see a show movie was, you know, The Sound of Music, right? And now it's probably, you know, The Age of Ultron or whatever it is. But there is no moment in The Age of Ultron where, say, Tony, wouldn't it be wonderful? Tony Stark, right, <laughs> stops and has like three minutes where he maybe, you know, was like, I'm really struggling. My dad's an alcoholic <laughs> and I'm sad and I'm afraid the world's going to end. And am I good enough to be me? Right. You can almost you can almost write Tony's Ari, right? We don't we don't have it. And, and in fact, the experience of watching a, a Marvel movie um, aided by fast cutting and any number of things, you know, it's really quite, it's a roller coaster and it's breathtaking, but I think it, it, it leaves you sort of feeling incomplete. I will say, I think capitalism is fine with you feeling incomplete because we kind of keep coming back, I think, hoping to have a feeling, right? I think it's part of that, that feeling of unsatisfaction or dissatisfaction is, is engineered by capitalism. It actually doesn't want us to feel tremendously satisfied. But what I'm saying is, is if you can imagine a version of a Marvel movie, you know, where the Avengers had arias, where they might talk or express a feeling, you're getting very much to one of the things. And again, Vitting does so many different kinds of things, but one of the things that bidding might do. And in fact, I have a, I have two Tony Stark bids in the book that allow you to have kind of three or four minutes to think, say what it's like to be Tony. And I think fans want that. I mean, in the same way that Pauline Kael wanted that out of the musical that, you know, you spend a lot of time with these characters and you, you know, you, you just want that breath, you know, or you want to actually think about characterization or emotion for like four minutes. You know what I'm saying? And I feel like, um, you know, one of the things to remember about fandom too, is that, it's, it's a supplemental art. Mm. It, 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 it assumes you've seen the movie, but it's like the four minutes you didn't get that you that really would have made that movie better. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so I find that, you know, a, 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 a useful way to explain, you know, w one of the things that bidding can can do. And in fact, I find it interesting that, you know, Marvel now doing television shows, for instance, seems to be about them recognizing, right, that it gives you a little bit more time to maybe like maybe just slow down and, you know, watch Hawkeye pet a dog, you know, right. um, that it doesn't always have to be that the pace of the sort of blockbuster is such and that that and I think that is a um, it's not a vid, but it's related. It's similarly related to like people want to maybe slow down a little bit and see, you know, a little bit more of a normal um, series of emotions or thoughts than you get in these things. And so that's one of the things that vidings can do. One one of the things that I think about when I think about, you know, you mentioned my interest in videographic criticism. Um, and, and I think we'll maybe talk about that more later, but I'm, I think it's probably just going to come up <laughs> every now and again, um, is this idea um, and, and you, you touch on this in the book is I, I really appreciate video essays or vids or, or anything that kind of feels like the creator is reclaiming a text in a sense. Um, and I feel this especially relevant when it's, uh, you know, reclaiming a big blockbuster, right? Whether it's Hitchcock or Marvel, right? It doesn't matter where or when it's from. Um, and you mention kind of the ways that whether it's The Sound of Music or The Avengers are kind of dismissed by serious film critics um, and that a lot of franchises it could be Harry Potter or, or something like that are, are more appreciated by vitters. And it's in I get the sense and I believe this is true and, and I get the sense this is what you're getting at in your book is that this kind of work is perhaps better suited to draw out what audiences and fans find so compelling uh, in these films than perhaps maybe a written film review in a newspaper. Is this true? Um, and if so, could you say more about Bidding's relationship um, with other forms of criticism? Like, what do you see it doing? And, and again, Bidding is not just criticism, but there's a critical element to it, to be clear. But how do you see it interacting with other yeah, other responses, interpretations to, to films? Just to say, when I say critical, right, I mean, I know not non-academics often think that you're being, that it's purely negative, right? right. Criticism. <laughs> yes. so when I mean critical, I mean kind of analytical, 
Right. right. I mean, just this. And and even when I mean and also to say when I mean analytical, I don't mean that every bidder sits down, you know, with a compass you know, <laughs> and a diagram. I mean, yeah. to, to to you know, to say that Harry should have been with Hermione instead of Ginny in the Harry Potter series is a is a critical argument. It's an analytical. You're making a case. Right. And if you were writing, you could write an essay about it. You could write an essay that would marshal the ways in which Harry and Hermione get on and make a case that they should have been, you know, that they seem better suited for each other than, you know, uh, you could write it as an essay, but you could also express it in art. And, and that would be critical, analytical without being scholarly or formal or right. So just to kind of say that about critical, I think, you know, one of the things you're saying about the giant blockbuster is it often feels doesn't feel personal. I mean, they really are. And I, I say this with love, but, you know, film is really an industrial product. Text is too, but it is less so. I mean, there really is, I know we have auteur theory, right? But there's a way in which uh, historically you had control over a text in a way that certainly in these giant movies, and even if you say in a Hitchcock movie, right, that they are they are large and they are made in a, in a studio system for a commercial market in a particular mode that can make them seem very impersonal. And one of the things that fan works do is they're handmade and they're local. And like, I use food metaphors for this sometimes, right? Like it's the difference between like buying a Twinkie and like making your grandma's, you know, family soup or something like that, right? That they're just different kinds of things. And a lot of times what you see in fan works are people essentially retailering, you know, if, if, if it's a, if that's an off the rack suit, you know, they take it and they, they make it fit them. They, 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 they alter it, but they don't just alter it to criticize it. They alter it. So it sort of fits them better. And in some ways it becomes a kind of like, it turns out that we're not all watching the same Marvel movie actually. Right. I mean, that we're, that lots of us are going for different things, right. A, a, you know, an eight year old boy might be going for, you know, Spider-Man awesome. Right. And, you know, and the, his mom is watching it for different kinds of things. And so you know, fan works are kind of record of reading in that way and or a record of how that work fit on a, an individual person. And in that way, vids are art. You know, they, they're not made for the market. They're solely, generally solely or sometimes collaboratively, which is another part. I mean, women sometimes come together to make to work together in kind of studios and share technology and just because it's fun to make stuff together like a theater troupe, but still a relatively small group of people are remaking the thing with a particular vision. And so that handmade, in fact, you know, I think it's handmade films, right? Isn't that, I think that's George Harrison. See the Beatles, you end up with the Beatles wherever you turn. Yes. <laughs> the Beatles production company was handmade films, right? I mean, it's that same ethos. Sorry, I mean, I don't know, I'm back at the Beatles, but this is how I keep finding the Beatles because right. in many ways, the it, certainly the Beatles are not the only practitioner of a kind of DIY aesthetic, but they were really, really famous, you know, I, but they were right. the most famous <laughs> practitioners of that. They were, they, they popularized it, you know, to an almost unprecedented degree, but that sort of sense of all together now, right? right? Or, you you know, you can do it yourself or, you know, in some ways that that sharing of the artistic impulse, a lot of people experience that with the sort of Beatles. And, and so the idea that, you know, you can, I mean, the average person doesn't have the budget to make an Avengers movie, but you could kind of recut four minutes of it. Right. Um, right. And, and, and this is also where vitting vitting is a particular kind of re-edit, but there are, it is on a spectrum with other kinds of re-editing things. You know, there's all these wonderful forms. Now YouTube has facilitated their distribution. A lot of people make, assume that YouTube is responsible for their creation, not necessarily, but it's certainly facilitated the distribution of things like new trailers, uh, recuts, supercuts, right? Video essays, right? Other, other, um, there's just right now going around as we do this podcast, there's a Supreme court uh, confirmation hearing happening. Um, and there's an edit that's going around right now on Twitter of um, Legally Blonde uh, with a few good men, right? Cutting, cutting together a cross-examination, right? And so people are kind of creating movies uh, out of pieces and whatever. And these are all related forms. Vitting is a particular, and in fact, one of the older, you know, forms of user generated cinema. And in Legally Blonde, I should note Reese Witherspoon's character makes a video essay to get in quotes to get into Harvard Law. But what you're saying with this DIY aesthetic to kind of return to technology, you write in the book and you think you've already mentioned this during our conversation, but that the invention of the VCR in particular is an essential development in the history of vitting and then later the development of digital technologies, Web 2.0. Um, but you, you quote Joanne Hanley as saying video was, quote, the first time that men and women artists worked in a medium on equal footing. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about technology as it relates to vitting. And in particular, it seems to me that the technology 
preserves this kind of DIY aesthetic, whether it's like the limitations of the VCR or even in digital technology today, you know, if we're really familiar with a Marvel movie, even if it's the sleekest editing, we'll probably be able to recognize that it is edited footage. So could you just walk us through that history and the technology that Vitters use? I would be happy to, though. I actually disagree with your last point. In fact, Mm. uh, vidding, contemporary vidding is so much, not all of it. I mean, some of it is not trying to be slick, but is so slick uh, Mm. that in fact, I think that you now see the pros borrowing techniques. Uh, Mm. A few years ago, you started to see like television, like doing these kind of video sequences, right? Doing trailers that were very vid inflected and stuff like this. And so you've, you've seen a fair amount of, I mean, obviously, vitters have borrowed from professional uh, editors um, and particularly title credits, which is kind of interesting. I have a section in the book where I talk about title credits often have a kind of vid like sensibility to them. Right. There's a sort of theme song and the way that the images kind of move and dance evokes something emotional that's not narrative that is like vidding. Um, but also we now see the pros copying, mm-hmm. uh, in my view, vidding techniques like they've seen vids and they understand why people. People like them and they're, they're, they sometimes will just sort of insert them as a montage in the middle of a show, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, the VCR is 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 crucial um, and is on a spectrum of other filmmaking technologies that particularly opened access. And I would say to women in, ge- you know, in specific, um, you know, the technology in, in you know, Abigail DeKosnick did a um, her dissertation on the fact that she thought that the most significant uh, artists of the 20th century were, you know, wh- white women writing fanfic and black men sampling music. And I bring up the history of sampling. The white women who did fanfic are the next door community to the white women who did vidding in the early days. And I and I specify the whiteness just because even so, it's still really expensive, right? It's 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 uh, filmmaking as an art. There's a reason that you know women write poetry, right? Which is like a pen and a notebook, like your cost of operation is really small. Theater and film, it's high. Um, And so it still is not an equal playing field. But um, Super 8 for women, video for women, we gave, you know, women cameras. And that really only starts like in the 60s. And that's the continuities with sort of women's experimental film and experimental video making. Uh, It's just those tools were so much more available. Um, the, The other piece of it was not just women, but fandom. And I say that because fans collect and archive. And in say 1981. Um, and you know, this is one of the, I, I, I was alive <coughs> in 1981. Um, I was young, but I was there. Um, in 1981, you, the only way you, you went to the movies or you watched what was shown on broadcast television. Um, the VCR had just come out. It was super expensive still. It was out, you know, two or three years or something like this. But I mean, a VCR cost thousands of dollars in 1980 dollars. And there is in 1980, like there's no blockbuster video. And I just say this, obviously there's no Netflix, but there's not even a blockbuster. There's no place that you can go really. There is, you know, very little in the way of kind of commercial video. And even what is there, the few things that are there really aren't professional VHS tapes, right, of the kind that are now so antiquated. But this is before that. And so the question is, where do you get the footage? And you know where you get the footage? Fans obsessively taping television. So the first people who had archives of footage were fans. Fans were early adopters of the VCR. And before they became writers, they were readers. And so fandom, and by which I mean, and because this is important to the history of fitting, organized fandom. And when I say organized, it's because obviously not every person could tape all of television. But in fandom, somebody was taping all of television. And so if you wanted to make a vid, and this is the truth, when I first got interested in vidding, somebody was like, oh, you have to watch my show. And I got a box sent to me that was four feet by four feet of 150 video cassettes, which was the run of the show. And of course, you wanted to tape. Fans were already conscious that they wanted to tape in the highest possible quality. So you wanted to have, this is where I'm going to date myself again. You could tape on a VHS tape two, four, or six hours. Two hours was the best for preserving quality. So you could get six hours of footage on a VHS tape, but the quality would be worse. And if you wanted to vid with it, make something with it, you wanted as high quality as you could get for taped off television. So only two episodes of television per tape and like 150 tapes that came to me in a box. Now this fan had made those, had double taped those tapes from her original set, right? And sent them to me to hope that I would get interested in the show and that possibly a vid would come out of it. So when I say walking, you know, walking in the snow, both 
ways, right? That was what was happening in the 80s. And so you can see where this is a subculture of extremely devoted fans um, and who are the only people who even had footage to then to then take that box of 150 video cassettes. And then you would have had watched it all. You would have had looked at all the visual patterns in it. And then maybe you make a vid that's that condenses all of that to like three and a half minutes. <laughs> that's yeah. what vidding is in 1980. Today, obviously, it's different, right? You have all this. Everything is streaming. You're, we're dr- you know, you started your intro by saying we're drowning in images, uh, nobody was drowning in images in you know 1982, um, but now we're drowning in images, and we have the ability to just you know rip a DVD, uh, cut three minutes out, right? You you, you, could, you know I, I hate to say a, a child could do it in the most basic sense of like you know rip, rip, ripping a DVD and getting you know put, putting together bits of footage on a timeline and iMovie or now increasingly DaVinci is a wonderful tool or whatever. Uh, it, it's so much simpler than it used to be, but the the technology so it was the technology and it was also the will. And and the sharing and and the effort that somebody would go through to tape 150 tapes and maybe mail them to a a fan in Sweden so that she could make a vid of the professionals, which is a show that would only have aired in Britain. Right. I mean, like that that kind of global network. And so when I talk about fandom as a community and as a network, it, it was not an individual experience because you couldn't do any of this as an individual, really. Just thinking and reading your book, I just kept coming back to thinking about like labor, the labor behind this video that I'm now, you know, your book, I read it on my iPad because I should have said it's an open access book and it has links to all of the um, videos that you do. So it was like the perfect experience. And here I am just going click, 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 you know, and it's like, oh, well, there's a so much work went in to making this. Um, and obviously there's still a lot of labor that goes into the digital technologies. But you talked about, yeah, just fans transporting these, getting trucks and these tapes and the preservation and everything. It's it's incredible. <laughs> Boxes of, right. I mean, it was, it was all just much, much, much more labor intensive. And so you had to be really motivated to do it, which meant that on some level you were in a filmic subculture. But of course, right. film has always been difficult to do. People who make film historically, right? It's always got a, I mean, I was going to say it's always had a little bit of a macho tinge, partly because of it. But of course, there's a female version of this too. And, you know, one of the things I talk about in the book is that the history of film editing is a female dominated form, remains a female dominated form. And there is an obsessiveness, right? It's not framed as macho, but the person who has to actually have to go through everything that the filmmaker has shot and make a movie out of it. Uh, it's that is labor intensive and requires all that obsessive seeing that mm-hmm. we you know, associate with with cinephilia. To keep going on editing, um, I want to follow up about um, what you said about or what I said about slickness um, and to just qualify to make sure no one thought that I, I didn't mean to demean anything or, or what have you. What I was trying to get at, and this will turn into a question, was is the goal to draw attention to the editing itself and to the remix, or is it to kind of create a new a new work that th- that doesn't show those traces on it, or are there different types of vids? What is the what is the thought process there? Because that's more what I was trying to to understand the the, the goal and aim there. Yeah, I mean uh, both. Mm-hmm. Increasingly, as vidding overlaps with you know people who are going to be. Uh, who want to be filmmakers. I mean, and that, that, and it's been relatively recently, I have, I had people applying to film studies at Muhlenberg and they're like, and I'm a vitter and now I want to come and be a filmmaker, right? Where they do want to show the editing, where the editing is very much the, I made this, right, is, is on display. In other vids, no. In fact, the, the, the goal is quite the opposite. And there's a, a whole school that felt that if you could kind of, they were trying to create an object and if you could see the hand of the vitter, you've done it wrong. Mm-hmm. But in fact, that's not that different than, like aesthetics and painting, right? Like some people really like painting where you can see the paint, <laughs> where you right. see that the thing is paint and they go, wow, that's a great painting. Uh, and other people feel that, you know, this see a, uh, I think it looks almost photorealistic, right? Oh my goodness, it looks like real satin on that dress, right? Is 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 paint, uh, is the best kind of painting. And so uh, now the, it, it tended to be earlier. I mean, if you were trying, when I quote somebody in the book who talks about bidding to win an argument. If you're trying to create a reading of a character to say, no, 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 I've got, I understand this character better than you. You often don't want it to look very showily edited, right? right. Because what you're trying to do is bring out what you are seeing as being in the text mm-hmm. and actually convince other people to read the text as you are reading it. Mm-hmm. And in that way, you d- by design, do not want to show off your editing. You want it to seem as if you were naturally bringing out the parts of the text that support your argument because you're obviously right. <laughs> right. <laughs> if you are looking to get into film school, 
uh, you know, or, or in fact, um, you know, uh, there's lots of different kinds of vids, but one of them that emerged was the dance vid, where if you actually really want to create vids to dance to at a party, you might be really, really happy for very kind of spectacular, showy editing. So mm-hmm. both of those exist. Yes. In, in the book, you write that, you know, traditional film culture is often upended by vidding. And to quote you directly, it is like a Hollywood mirror verse, or it is the men who are strange and oh so mysterious and in need of intense collaborative scrutiny. Um, in that the community of uh, primarily women creators are often, quote, the editor as well as the audience of such work. And you connect vidding to Laura Mulvey and visual pleasure and narrative cinema and talk about vidding as, you know, that essay uh, in that essay, Mulvey kind of puts out this call for a new kind of cinema. And you say that vidding is kind of heeds this call in a sense. I wonder if you could just kind of elaborate on this for our audience and and talk about this community of, of of creators and how they thought about their work kind of as this this, this counter to what you say is like this traditional film culture. Right. I mean, and, and part of it, you know, again, when I this is literally the, the last bit of the book is mm-hmm. when I talk about the history of, of women film editors. And while it is true that the Hollywood editor is much more likely than in any other part of the Hollywood film experience to be female. She is often having to edit to the male director's vision, right? Mm-hmm. And she, um, and, and of course we even know about the kind of famous exceptions. I mean, sort of Marsha Lucas telling, you know, George Lucas, uh, you know this story, right? That you know, Marsha Lucas at the end of Raiders uh, literally was like, you know, you realize you left Marion on an island of melted Nazis, right? And made them go and get more footage, right? To 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 satisfy that emotional arc, right? Mm-hmm. I, I mean, this is the kind of work that women do of saying, I, I, I'm missing that emotional beat. How I don't care what happens to the arc. I care what happens to the relationship. And in Vidding, women get to be the editors, but to their own aesthetic. And that's where it upends Hollywood, right? They're not doing it for Tarantino or Hitchcock or, or, or Lucas. They're doing it for their own pleasure. And so they're creating a, a, a vision and edit of the film that satisfies them and not the marketplace and not the male gaze. Um, but beyond that, it also goes to what I was saying about musicals and Marvel movies in that the musical is a female dominated form. In fact, uh, all the really great, I mean, is reason we have the diva, but you know, really the great parts tend to be women and then some guys, uh, whether it's, you know, Mame or Maria or whoever, um, the, the blockbuster tends to be male dominated. And so in, in turning the blockbuster into a musical, <laughs> right. On some level you are, it is, it's Tony Stark who's mysterious or Steve Rogers or Luke Skywalker or whoever, uh, Darth Vader, right. I mean, what's, what's, who's the man behind the mask. Right. So it, it does create, a, create a kind of reversed situation where the female in the dark behind the camera is trying to change the performance of the spectacleized male, right? Um, and coerce, really, an emotional response, right? Create and, you know, kind of, uh, you know, it's almost redirecting, you know, like, let, let's have it again, Mark Hamill, but with feeling, right? How do you feel about having lost your aunt and uncle? And, you know, and, <laughs> and that you're the woman you loved is actually your sister. How do we feel about that, right? But so I'm going to redirect it. Now, obviously, you can't go back and redirect it and you don't have that social power, but you can kind of do it in the edit. Uh, and so that is a flip, an almost direct flip. Uh, or about as direct a flip as you can get while acknowledging that film is on some level and objectifying, you know, but that's not, a, that's not necessarily a bug, right? I mean, it's a, it's a little bit of turnabout is fair play. Like we get to objectify some dudes now and, and, and uh, that seems okay to me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I love this image of like, you know, it's, it's just like if the director was locked out of the, the editing room and just all the raw footage was there and someone could create their, their, their own work from it. Really helpful imagery in, in that vein and talking about kind of the community of practitioners, one of the things you talk a lot about in the book is the significance of conventions and kind of other physical gatherings uh, to vitting. So could you talk about that significance and how that has changed given the development of the internet and online communities? Because in going back to labor, you talked about how there are these conventions and the VCR days and people would come with trucks and be sharing things and stuff like that. Whereas now that has obviously changed. So I'd be curious to know. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Well, and in fact, I, I, um, you know, I don't mean to convey, I mean, the book is called Vitting a History. And part of it is that I did want to preserve some of this analog history, particularly it's the book is not only about the analog uh, right. phase of vitting, it goes into the modern phase and the digital phase. But it, it does tend to be the kind of thing that the person listening to a podcast in 2022 knows more about, and maybe surprised to know, right, that people were doing this sort of stuff in analog um, previously. And, uh, 
even in you know this century, the VividCon convention, there, there are many conventions that were important to vidding, um, but there was a vidding specific convention that ran 2002 to 2018. Um, and you know you have to remember YouTube only came out in 2005, end of 2005. And also you will not, you may or may not remember this. Um, it was not very good when it started. And when I say it wasn't very good, it did not have very, it didn't have great audio visual sync. Audio visual synchronicity is at the heart of vidding, right? And so vidders got one look at YouTube. And in fact, it took years before they came back when mm -hmm. high def came in and but if you don't have audio visual synchronicity, like to the to the fraction of the second, a, a, a vidder who cares about their work. And remember, the obsessive person who's done all of this, they care. <laughs> they rejected it. And in fact, they went to other streaming platforms that had better audio visual sync and better networking tools. Um, so, and you know, that's the sort of uh, post digital life. But before that, if you wanted to see a video, you had to go somewhere. <laughs> sounds, I mean, or you had to have a tape mailed to you. I mean, I, I saw my first vids were mailed to me on a VHS tape. A vidder would make a vid and have to dupe tapes. And you would be like, it would be like, send me six bucks. And this was not, by the way, a commercial enterprise. The six bucks would be, I'll, you know, you would buy stacks of tapes and you would, I'll double tape it for you with my own labor, which I was not charging you for or whatever. We would double tape it for you and put it in the mail. So it was the tape and postage. And you would get a, a videotape with vids on it. Um, and vidders, I have examples of this in the book. They're quite pretty. We made, made covers and branding and collections and all this kind of stuff. So you could have it mailed to you to play on your VCR in your house, uh, or you could go to a convention and often there would be, I mean, in later years, there was a vid, as vidding really kind of solidified, vidders improved the circumstances of the showing. So suddenly they wanted, they wanted big screens, they wanted total darkness, silence, right? It became much more theater-like, art, you know, better sound, all this kind of stuff. But in the early days, I mean, you might have, you know, a TV on a, on a media stand, Right, with a VCR and literally, you know, a regular, just normally, we didn't have these giant TVs either, you know, a real box of a set, you know, you would go to the kind of vid room and watch vids on a television at a convention, but that that's where you would see them. And so you had to fly. I mean, this is the other piece of it, you know, this is my general fan studies um, hat, but fandom has gotten much younger, which is wonderful as a result of the internet, because you can play from your own bedroom. In olden days, fandom was older because you had, you had to basically be able to buy like a plane ticket or get in a car and go someplace um, in order to participate in a communal fanish experience. Um, and so, you know, the things that grownups do are somewhat different than the things that kids do, uh, you know, in a certain way. So yeah, the convention experience was really important. And then in fact, it's, um, I'm really torn right now because the convention experience for vids is on the decline, partly because you don't have to go somewhere now to see vids. You can just watch it on your screen. On the other hand, and if you know if you went to Middlebury, you'll know, I mean, as, as a cinema person, I have to say I've been thinking a lot about screen size um, and just realizing myself as a, as a film professor, <laughs> there were films that I would have said I'd seen that I realized I've never seen because I've never seen them on a big screen. Um, and I used to be more, I mean, there's always this trade-off, which is a, a feminist, I'm interested in particularly between accessibility um, and art artistic experience. But I have to say just recently, having had the experience of seeing like Chaplin on a big screen, I was like, wow, I've never seen a chat. I thought I'd seen a Chaplin, but no, I've never seen it. It's a totally different experience on a large screen. And with vids as with other cinema, some of it, um, the vidders themselves talk about, they have what they call convention vids versus living room vids uh, versus digital vids. Like they themselves know what mm. kind of a vid they're making. And a con vid doesn't work on a small screen in the way that, you know, Lawrence of Arabia doesn't really work on YouTube. You know, I tell them, I said, do not watch, please do not watch Lawrence of Arabia on a three by four inch computer screen. It's, 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 you, you have not seen it, but at the moment, anyway, it is just hard enough to travel and hard enough to, you know, expensive enough that it's hard to get people together in a room to watch vids. Uh, the, the dancing uh, vid. Could you, could you just describe uh, that genre of vidding to the audience? Yeah. When I, when I say that vidding was a, you know, really important filmic subculture, I think people are often surprised by kind of how developed it was. I mean, right. it, for, for, 
uh, you know, Vivid Con was 2002 to 2018, but before that, there was Escapade from 1991, and they had premiere shows. In other words, there was a place that if you were in this vidding community, which was, you know, it wasn't enormous, but it was several hundred people um, and hangers. I mean, you know, several hundred vidders and assorted hanger-ons and another uh, you know, larger group of vid fans who, you know, would come 200 at a time or something like that. But the point of it is you had a substantial audience that would come together to watch a, a premiere show annually of, say, 30 vids that you hadn't seen curated in a, in a thematic couple of hours, right? With an intermission and the whole bit, right? And, and that you would go to a theater space and watch, you know, 30 in a row. I mean, so it, it was formal in that way. Um, and then, in fact, and, and I'll, I'll add this because in some ways the, 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 the dance vid is a kind of antithesis of this in a way or a, 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 a foil to this. But so there was a kind of art show, like Oscar party kind of, you know, we're going to show the vids. Um, and then, in fact, Vitter's instituted a kind of art review. So the next morning after the premiere show was often a two or three hour vid analysis of vid. You would get moderators and you would watch vids and have community discussion and talk about what they did, you know, technologically or artistically, if they liked them, did they work? People would have their vids (laughs) <laughs> Critic, I mean, criticized in the negative sense. I didn't like it at all. I don't think it worked. The cuts were too long. It, right. I mean, you, you could, you were exposed, you know, like in an art review kind of a world, um, you know, obviously to people loving it and people saying, eh, that didn't really work for me for these reasons. Right. So in that context, um, VividCon eventually started to do a thing called Club Vivid, which was a dance party of vids um, in which, and people started making original work for Club Vivid. And part of it was, uh, it was a very different way to show your newest work, um, but it also required something different. I mean, you know, your vid could be the best vid in the world, but if you can't dance to it, <laughs> it's a failure at Club Vivid, right? I mean, uh, it has to be cut and move um, and work in a different way. And so, in fact, many of the most um, the most viral vids were Club Vivid vids. Um, your your group in particular might have heard of a vid called Vogue, um, which I only mentioned because it got a fair amount of press when it came out. It went viral very quickly. It's a 300 uh, vid set to Madonna's Vogue and went viral very quickly, but was designed as a dance vid. I mean, it was it was built to be danced to um, and was incredibly catchy in all of these ways and did go viral. And then, in fact, uh, Madonna, I mean, Madonna did at the Super Bowl halftime show something that looked an awful lot like Vogue and where, you know, the Internet the next day was like, oh, my God, Madonna has done Luminosity's Vogue at the Super Bowl show Um, or saying somebody did somebody, you know, um, Vogue featured sort of dancing gladiators, which is not the most natural image when you think about voguing. I mean, she talks about Marilyn Monroe and all these things. There's really no reason to put dancing gladiators unless you're the brilliant, twisted genius that is Luminosity, who decided to vid 300 in this kind of toxic masculinity as dance party. But then Madonna or somebody in Madonna's camp, right, decided that the Super Bowl, the pinnacle of toxic masculinity, (laughs) um, to stage Vogue live, essentially, and have dancing gladiators, right? Uh, and that was five years after Vogue that there was a sort of ripple on effect. Right. But the idea of having a vid you could dance to uh, was also, a, um, you know, an innovation. In, in talking about the dancing vids in your book, you, you talk about how those were also kind of a way that vids became more popular and well known in the community because year to year at these conventions, people would be like, oh, I want to dance to that vid. And then they would like put it back up on the screen. And I'm, I'm very interested in, in kind of the act of curation and how how you went about finding the works to talk about and include in this book. And more generally speaking, if someone's listening to this conversation right now and they're like, I want to watch a lot of vids beyond your book and kind of scholarly sources, how does one go about finding such videos and online communities? The curation part is very interesting. And this is a general fandom thing. Like, uh, you know, I, I, I feel, I won't say I'm a fraud, uh, but I come in late in the game um, often to kind of formalize things that fandom has already decided. Grassroots fandom, which is not, you know, which I was going to say is not full of scholars, but of course is full. Of, I mean, you know, a lot of fans are happen to be our professors, our librarians, our archivists, right? Or our, our, our writers or journalists. I mean, in fact, but, but every, but this, that's not the only thing fans are, right? There's every kind of person in the world in fandom, but fans have been very good about um, preserving their own history um, and creating their own, Canons. Um, and in fact, that's one of the things I try to say in the book. There's a vid called Previously, 
uh, which is an intro vid that literally the conceit of it was that it was like those previously that were on TV back when it was broadcast, you know, previously on the X-Files, you know, Mulder and Scully were doing this. Well, this was previously at VividCon and the previously makers sort of chose a bunch of vids that they, you know, here's what you missed, right. but that you can kind of see that as a sort of canon formation, right. Of, of, of obviously on the one hand saying what you've missed, but also of course, it's also a, um, a vid that's meant to rouse up its audience of being like, oh yeah, I recognize that one and that one and that one and that one, right? Like a like a like um you know to to, to a motivator and a and a, a crowd pleasing uh, thing. So, um, but VividCon and Vitters almost always had a history show. Uh, mm-hmm. The history I've outlined, I mean, is. You know, I'd love to say I, 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 I did not develop all this research on my own. This is a lot of me formalizing what vitters have told me. Um, but there was always a history show. There would be genealogies of vitting. Um, vitters would, you know, like the way that PhD students do. PhDs will often say, I studied with X who studied with a student of Y. Um, mm-hmm. Vitters track themselves that way. Like, oh, I learned how to vid from... Mary Van Dusen, I learned how to vid from Sandy Herald of the Media Cannibals. And the sense of schools, it, it's not that they had a formal sense of schools, but there were groups, right? I mean, if you learned to vid from a vidder, you were sort of part of their kind of aesthetic. You just kind of were, were part of their sort of aesthetic. Right. So, so some of the work of canon formation was done for me. Mm. In that way, and in fact, I tried to make sure that I that I picked up like I did not make the previously vid I, where I could really say, OK, the vids in here were chosen by somebody as, you know, 20 important vids or the club vivid playlist. And as you say, there were vids that were so popular that it was just demand to have to dance them year after year after year. And so obviously that's a kind of, you know, grassroots canon formation right? The vids that appeared routinely in the genealogy or sometimes the genealogy was show was called history of vidding or genealogies of vidding or uh, those vids I tried to collect in the book. And that's just me saying these are vids that vidders have told me were found. Foundational. So that's the kind of um, curation question. And in fact, the the second part of the question is different only because in the digital age, so you would be like, wow, so it should be so much better, right? And the answer is yeah, because not so right, because there's now so much of everything right. and the everything is being organized algorithmically, right? Uh, by search engines that surface certain things and make other things invisible, that even though there are more vids than there have ever, ever been and better vids than there have ever, ever been, the average person might say, I, there are no vids anymore. What happened to vidding? Uh, and the answer is there are vids, but you can't find them. And, and when I say you can't find them, I mean, an individual is trying to connect with the vid that is meaningful to them. It's an increasingly difficult thing to do. Uh, and that's about the commercialization of the internet. And it's about the fact that the community maybe has, exp- I mean, you know, when there were 500 people, you could just ask, you, you knew who you were looking for. When right. there are millions of people and, you know, your question before about, um, you know, what does the technology do? I mean, now you have, I mean, there's, there's, a, um, there's a huge community of Russian vitters. In fact, I'm quite worried. <laughs> I'm worried about the Russian vitters. Um but, but entire vitting forums in Russian, which I know exist, but in fact are only minimally, please Russian vitters write your own book because I can't read your forums, which I can see exist. And I can see the skill that you were bringing to your work. Um, but I don't read Russian and I cannot really understand the conversations you're having, but there are Russian forums where people are trading tech and tools. Right. There are Brazilian vitters, right? There, are, So there are communities in countries and there are also people who are working among these global communities. And there are places where people are still sharing footage. I need a, it might be like, I, I need a clip that does this or features that, right? You can now just sort of send the clip. Um, so the global community of vidders is great, but it means that if you personally um, are trying to find a vid that works for you, you just might drown on you. You know, it's like trying to find something on YouTube. It's, it's probably there, but good luck. You know, how many, how many layers down, and how many vids are you going to watch to be kind of connected with the vid that's meaningful to you? So uh, a kind of a side story to that is uh, Rebecca Tushnet, um, who is a lawyer uh, and one of the co-founders of the Organization of Transform- for Transformative Works. She and I have been to Capitol Hill several times doing legal advocacy work um, on vids and on technology related to vids, copyright and, and DMCA encryptions and things like this. But when we were doing advocacy uh, Rebecca was kind of a genius at this. She would sort of find out, you know, you'd be talking to the clerk of a senator or a representative and she, you know, if you could find out what shows they were watching, you could <laughs> probably bring a vid. Like if you're like, oh, you're a fan of Sex in the City or Will and Grace or right. you know, whatever. <laughs> Uh, the wire, you like the wire. And um, we would sometimes, you know, we would bring a vid because we knew that 
if you talk about fitting in the abstract, people are like, yeah, it doesn't sound very interesting. But if it's a show you care about, <laughs> very quickly, people are like, oh my God, that's brilliant. Uh, because they understand what's happening visually. Because, mm. um, I, and in fact, we haven't said this, but bidding is super context dependent. It, it was kind of implied when I said, you know, you would get 150 video cassettes in a box and you would watch them all and then distill them into meaningful footage. But on some level to do a reading, you really have to understand it and you have to understand it narratively and also visually. Like bidders will remember, like I need a scene where a character walks from left to right, <laughs> you know, wearing red, because that's going to be the match cut to the next bit. I mean, that it's, it's a really technical way of seeing as well as a, a narrative way of seeing. But, uh, you know, it, the, the, if you just look at it, you might just think, oh, look, pretty pictures set to music. You know, just and in fact, uh, the average person stumbling on a vid for a fandom they don't care about would just be like, oh, look, it's pictures. Um, and in fact, people have, have, have done that and it dr- that will drive a bidder crazy. Right. Uh, to not understand that um, that every frame is significant. And so if you're trying to make you know legal advocates understand this, it helps to show them something in their fandom. Um, mm. And in fact, I, I, I interrupt here to say something else that I haven't said, but it is worth saying. Um, vidding is, is context dependent and it's super dense. And in fact, the dance vid is unusual to the extent to which it kind of assumes that you might turn your head away from it while you're mm. dancing. It assumes you're watching, but it does. it is built that if you look away and you look back, you don't miss it. Mm. But a typical vid assumes that you are looking at it like clockwork orange. You know what I mean? Like with, with your eyes open and staring at it. And the act of watching a vid is about listening to the audio, listening to the song and using the song to interpret the visuals as they come through. Mm. And it's about using the every bit of information in the audio track where it is using like the lyrics. So if it, it could be like there are, there are ballad vids where it's like, you know, there once was a man and he wrote a horse. Well, you might be seeing a man and a horse and then you're like, okay, that's that guy, right? It's telling you the story. Um, or it might be, there's a symbol crash and that symbol crash is on a bit of, you know, internal motion in the frame. And it's telling you, look there. Like it's a very, um, it's why in the book I, I do a lot of um, analogies to poetry right. in its kind of short form denseness. In other words, every word matters. You can't skip every other word in poem in a poem and expect to understood the poem. So a vitter will get really pissed off if you look away. Right. If you're watching a bit and then you turn to have a, you know, sideways to have a conversation, the bit will be like, no, no, you have to watch the whole thing uh, and listen and, 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 and yourself kind of uh, suture the audio and the visual, right. As you're seeing it to make meaning. It's, it's, it's quite remarkable. This seems like a good uh, point to transition to quickly asking you about um, what you make of videographic criticism um, as it compares to vidding, because um, I have some thoughts on what you just said, but I'll let you go first. Um, Because obviously, if anyone's listening to this and doesn't know, uh, this show is a companion to the video essay podcast um, that I host. Um, And so I'm wondering, do you see vidding as having influenced video essays? What are some of the key differences, the similarities, just... What are your thoughts? I know you teach video essay in, in, in so yes. No, and I, and I so, love yes. the video. Yeah. And I love the video essay for much of the same reason. Um, and, you know, video, as far as I know, in fact, video, gra- video graphic essay makers have been among the most enthusiastic uh, fans of vids. Um, they understand the continuities with vidding. Uh, many of them have been influenced by vidding. Many of them are vidders themselves. So there's a lot of kind of continuity with it. Um, vidding is the older form, as, as I say. And, and again, part of it is that people didn't have the tools. I mean, I, now I'm teaching a course in which I have my students make videographic essays. That was really possible even just to assume that students had that technology or access to it only in the last like two, three years, could you assume uh, that students could do it without you having to kind of teach a whole course in technology or go to a media studies uh, room or something like this. But yeah, that, that, that kind of close seeing that kind of image analysis uh, you know, the, the paying attention to cuts, the, uh, you know, is very like bidding. Um, again, it's a, it, often for sort of different purpose, but not always. In fact, I think a lot of like, you know, Catherine Grant's work is about making you feel differently about um, about the work. Uh, so there's definitely a line. I don't even want to say that all videographic essays are strictly analytical, right? They, right. I think the good ones are, there really are artworks in their own. Uh, and I know that even the videographic criticism has a kind of 
uh, the semi-permeable border with the video essay where people are just sort of recutting for beauty, right? And then the recutting for beauty are, you know, maybe has some kind of analytical purpose or is drawing something out. But, you know, in, in, in the less analytical way than the kind, you know, the sort of every frame of painting kind of a way, right? Where it's like, look, you know, let's pay attention to these cuts or let's pay attention to this kind of shot. So I think, yeah, they're, they're, I, I would say the thing about fan bidding is it's less ashamed. And what I mean by that is like the cinephilia is just on its sleeve and the desire to make something that is about pleasure is overt. Uh, the vid wants to make you happy. And it, or and it, that doesn't mean always that happiness is the emotion or it wants to make you cry or it wants to make you feel, right? But it's really overt in its kind of artistic intentions where I think some videographic criticism does that, but a lot of it is analytical and is maybe nervous. And I think, you know, film studies in general, is, it's, 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 it can be a little nervous about the line between, you know, fandom and serious business. And part of that, of course, is because it's a re- film studies is, relatively new and TV studies even newer. Right. And so there's a certain amount of like, you know, we are doing science, you know, we're doing science here um, that it is using to justify that it's not about going to university to watch movies. Right. Oh, people think it's just watching movies. I maybe have less of that anxiety. Right. And not just because I come from English, which is, you know, we make you read books, we make you read novels, which people do for fun, like, you know, for school. But also, I think because I'm a drama person and like drama is 2000 years old, like we got some game in drama. I'm not I don't feel particularly threatened. I feel like I'm very secure that drama has a place in the artistic history of the world. Uh, And so I can kind of go to the I get to my pleasure center, I think, faster than a lot of people do. But almost that's the line, you know, And and I love seeing some of these videographic essayists really just experimenting with making things beautiful or satisfying, right? right. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I would love to ask you about that. If, if, you know, if you're seeing that trend in creating a kind of artistic, like, a, yeah, an analytical object that really is an artistic object. Yeah, I think that is, you know, we sort of talk about this uh, spectrum that people like Christian Keatley have laid out where there's like the explanatory to the poetic spectrum of the video essay. And so I think that poetic side absolutely takes so much and is so influenced by by bidding. Um, and, and I think, but then I think there are some who see that the video can really only be essayistic if it has a voiceover or if it has a lot of text on screen um, which of course is not really what vitting is after. And we talk about context, which I think is such a key difference. I think there is an impulse in the video essay, not always, of course, but to kind of throw in that what would be a graph in a written essay of the film takes place here and does this, 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 and here's four sentences where I sum up everything. Um, it is so, so something that I think we would associate even with video essays that dip into the poetic a lot. You know what you, but you, what you've just made me realize, and I thank you for this insight, right? It, it, is that it's not about the object in that case, it's about the audience. Mm-hmm. And the, so what you've just said is the inverse of what I just said, which is, uh, if you don't understand, if you don't know the fandom, the video will be meaningless to you. Right. And I think videographic essay people are trying to reach everyone. Yes. Right. In other words, they do not presume your fandom. Right. Exactly. <laughs> right. So if you are not a fan, the assumption is you don't know who these people are or why it's set or what's going on. And so you might need a voiceover or some kind of paratextual material to have it make sense. Right. But. I, this book is a little, I'm going to say something complicated here and I'll try to make it clear, but in a way, this book is an apology because a lot of my first work on Vitting emphasized its critical orientation, its essayistic orientation, because I was trying to explain to people the way in which it was speech and the way in which within fandom, the, these messages were understood as analytical, critical arguments. So, you know, if I do um, one of the essays in the book, for instance, uh, is a dollhouse vid. Joss Whedon had a show called Dollhouse about women you could rent. And the vidder made a vid to uh, the Fantastics, the song about rape, right? It's about the quality of the rape. And the whole song is, you know, rape, 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 right? There's no voiceover. But I think if you're setting a song about rape to a vid about Dollhouse, that meaning is clear without, and even if you were not a fan of Dollhouse, you could kind of get the gist as to what is being talked about here. Right. Um, and so in trying to express, in trying to make an argument to to mostly the legal forces that this is a form of free speech and online with the videographic essay, I really emphasized the critical orientation of this within the fandom, right. possibly even over the poetic. And part of it is that, but but the truth is, if you're in the fandom, it's doing both. 
because you you don't have to be told this is Steve Rogers and, you know, his mother died of tuberculosis. And that's why he's crying in this vid that is about mothers. Like right. I can supply all this context for you. And and so it, it is making an argument of the videographic kind, but it's not it's it is the vid has intentionally narrowed its audience mostly to fans. Right. The videographic essay does not choose to limit its audience that way, but that doesn't mean it's any less valid or analytical. Yes. And one thing your book helped me think about was I think a key difference here, and we're going to get to YouTube in, in, in a minute as kind of one of our final questions. But the reason I wanted to talk about this before, and your book was very helpful in helping me realize this, was that we see the video essay is very much a post the invention of YouTube and these platforms phenomenon. So I think a lot of video essayists are publishing for YouTube or publishing for Vimeo, in which this kind of wider audience is informing the aesthetics and analytical aspect of the work. Whereas you talk about vidding kind of being a pre-YouTube phenomenon. And then also in the book, you talk about how YouTube changed it and how it influences aesthetics and things like that. So, you know, I'm generalizing here a lot, but I think that is an important aspect to it. And now increasingly, we see that video essays might be, um, in, in, in particularly in a, in a scholarly context, might be wanting to be published in a journal or something like that. Or now a lot of film critics who make video essays want to publish them with a a, a Little White Lies or a Sight and Sound or something like that. And so sometimes they have to take on this more journalistic approach. And now even we see like Vox.com, The Ringer, places like that are now making video essays um, as part of their YouTube channel that will exist alongside a video recording of their podcast or what have you. Uh, And so I think that is uh, a key distinction. Right. But I mean, but platforms matter. I mean, yes, of course. And YouTube, you know, I mean, listen, I think YouTube ought to be a public utility. I think it ought to be taken over and that it's it's actually much too valuable to be private in the way that it is, but it is. And uh, so, you know, uh, so much of my work has been about emphasizing the difference between things made even remotely for money. And the things with vidders, I mean, the thing about YouTube is that it is increasingly a commercial platform, but it is also has a history of hosting or distributing non-commercial work that was not made for it. Right. But you. I'm going to, I'm going to personalize YouTube for a minute here. YouTube knows that we didn't make it for it and it doesn't like us. YouTube likes the work made for it more. And both in terms of the sort of stuff that can be monetized, it likes it more, but, um, you know, Tony Zhu talks about the fact that he had to hack the algorithm uh, to, to be able to make his essays. He had to figure out how to make essays in such a way that the the algorithm wouldn't bury them. And that, so, so the whole thing was dictated by YouTube, aesthetically dictated by YouTube. And some vitters now do work within YouTube's, like they've, they have they may not have thought that they've studied it. Yes, they may not have thought that they studied it, but they have studied it. So for instance, a lot of the vids that you are more likely to have seen because they went viral are very flashy. And part of it is, you know, that thing, if they, if you don't, if, if they don't grab you in the first 10 seconds of YouTube, if you don't stay, if you go out, it, nothing about YouTube rewards a slow build, for instance. But if you think about my earlier comparison to musical theater, many of the best songs, right? Like the big notes are in the end of the song. They don't start that way. And so there's a kind of bombastic quality to many of the more popular YouTube vids. Not that they're not good, but the, it's just about what's being, uh, raised up. And so that platform stuff really matters a, a great deal. And I do hope actually that, you know, videographic criti- um, critics and video makers will move off YouTube because it will, exp- I mean, it will expand their aesthetic potentials. I mean, making things nonprofit and making things artistically, as opposed to the demands of a platform uh, results in different work. And so, you know, and in fact, a lot of, um, you know, vidders will essentially just use YouTube or Vimeo as hosting and then it, try to embed it in a place, you know, where, the people, the fans that they actually want to reach will see it. But, you know, YouTube certainly doesn't like that. So unless you're then on the inside, if you're on YouTube looking for that vid, it's going to bury it because it likes embeds less, right? It, there's all right. these things it likes less, which I had to learn about for the book. I think I know, you know, much, much more than I did about how algorithms and, and, and streaming video functions and all of it rather relatively dislikable. And I would love yeah. it if I think it should be a public utility. I agree with you completely. And I'm, yeah, I'm just fascinated on how it, it seems that we've kind of it, except we and whatever that means have accepted that YouTube is uh, this kind of cultural archive which is just really dangerous <laughs> to, to 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 think about yeah as things start to move I mean you're already seeing it where there's the privileging of pro you know pro influencers and pro channels I mean you know you start wondering you know are, are we all are we all going to be either knocked off or 
buried. And fans, fans are used to that. I mean, you know, the, the archive of our own, which is a fan fiction archive that was developed by um, the Organization for Transformative Works, was designed partly because, uh, you know, there were constantly takedowns and stuff of on, on fan fiction. Um, video is just a harder nut to crack for any number of reasons. But, you know, the, the old internet where you could be, you know, which, where you were both the audience and the artist, right? And maybe today you were the artist and tomorrow you were the audience. I mean, to me, I just think that that's, I mean, I do have an agenda. I think that's culturally healthy. I think it's right. good. I am, I'm a media professor who's anti-spectatorship, right? I feel like the, the kind of, um, the, the increase, what I don't like about the mass media is the way in which it really seems to want to posit, you know, a very small number of people as artists and everybody else as some kind of passive consumer. Consumer and everything I care about is about resisting that mode of passive consumption. And I think theater has done it better than many in that, you know, who goes to the theater? People who like the, you know, there's, a the, there's still a theater community. It's not ridiculous to talk about a theater community. And a lot of people who see plays or actors themselves are going to, you know, I'm, not, I'm going to see your show, but you'll come see my show in three weeks or something like that. Right. right. Um, I, I have a fair amount of roots in the punk rock community of downtown New York, you know, and I'm seeing your band and then you're going to come and stay and see my band. And that's how that works. It's nice when that, you know, there was a, there was a moment with the internet where that was true, <laughs> um, both with fiction and with, with video. Um, and so in some ways, the professionalization of all of this and the professionalization, according to commercial models that we, we, the artists, filmmakers, cinephiles didn't design, is, you know, is not great. It would be nice to have a community uh, that was apart from that. In, in the book, you talk about how Vitter, Vitters at kind of the, in the earliest days of YouTube, were, were really concerned about the, the, the platform and kind of striking this balance between, as you say, holding on to this work and making sure that it stays within communities, making sure that it's not just stolen and and re-upload elsewhere, but also wanting to participate in this remix culture that they were so essential to helping create. And so it's a very interesting, uh, you know, tension there. And I'm wondering if you could just elaborate on that a little bit. What were those conversations going on at the time? That was such a, cr- I mean, it's, that's still, that's still a fast, I'm so glad that you actually pulled that um, thread out of the book. It's true because the, the tension between visibility, I mean, people, you know, Peggy, I quote Peggy Phelan all the time saying visibility is a trap. And I think particularly this moment where we're all like, we want to be visible, we want to be represented. And it's like, yeah, but there are costs to that. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, there are costs to not being visible or represented. If you think about the census, that if you're not seen. And I'm enough of a historian that I came down on the visibility side, which is, a, you know, <laughs> I tell the story at the beginning of the book, but this book started in some ways as a grudge. It, it was going to a conference at Harvard in 2003, where we didn't even have have the word remix yet. They were talking about digital creativities and it was almost all dudes. There were just no women. Uh, and there was this, and they were calling it digital creativity. And they were saying, wow, look at all these interesting things that people are doing on the internet. And I was like, wow, they don't know about any of the exciting things that fandom is doing that is that are much more, I mean, literally that same year, they had a 30th anniversary of vidding party. Uh, they had had a, a, like an anniversary. And I was like, wow, I have a 30 year tradition of, of doing remix culture. And you don't even know that that's, that it exists. Uh, and, you know, you have that moment of like, well, screw you. I'm like, fine. We just have fun and do it over here. And then you have that, oh, you know, but I felt compelled to sort of say, but actually, guys, you know, it's great. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. But like right. you know, women have done some of this. And, you know, again, as an English professor, I had felt that way about the novel. I mean, that's sort of, you know, Richardson and Fielding did the novel. And you're like, yeah, there were a bunch of women writing gothic fiction, except you didn't, you know, talk about it. And you said it was crap. And so you guys started doing it. But actually, women invented the novel. And you said it was a bad girly art form. And obviously, film, by the way, film people too, right? I mean, Mary Pickford, hello, right? The early history of, of cinema is women's, you know, when filmmaking was crap uh, and they thought it was a dumb thing to do. There were a million women directors in the tens and the twenties, and then they all go away, right? Because it becomes serious, serious business. And um, yeah, I did weigh in on that in a big way of saying, okay, fine. But the flip side of that was that this work in its essence is not, unlike videographic criticism, is not trying to reach everybody. It was made for specific subcultural audiences. And there were two dangers. One was the danger of being laughed at. I mean, the, the danger of just saying, oh, look, pretty pictures. OK, that's one kind of danger. But also people would be like, that's stupid or ridiculous or illegal, which was really the second thing. I mean, it was really unclear because it had been such an underground form uh, whether this was legitimate. And this is where we had to get into the legal advocacy work because the men had just no they were just like, well, I've made a thing. I'm going to show it to the world. There was no concern. Women were much more nervous of like, you know, am I going to get in trouble? <laughs> We're doing this. And so we had to kind of work to make sure 
that no, they wouldn't. And it's and the irony of women saying that they were worried about getting in trouble because in fact, the women's stuff was much, there's a weird irony here about fan works, which is women and que- I should say women, queer, people of color tend to make fan works that are actually much more transformatively free speech. Boys tend to make much more what we call affirmative fan works, which is like kind of, isn't this awesome? And legally speaking, it's the transformative stuff that's more legal than the affirmative stuff. But despite the fact that that's how the law goes, the creators obviously like the affirmative stuff better. So, you know, Steven Spielberg, it thinks it's wonderful that a bunch of 12 year olds did a shot by shot remake of Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? Which your readers will no doubt know about your listeners. But, you know, George Lucas does didn't like you know, slash fiction or or fan fiction made by girls, which is a sort of girly, right? Even though that's legally the more protected stuff. So we also had to kind of work to create a climate for Vitters to say, don't be embarrassed and don't be afraid. But that's that's what happens when art moves beyond its subculture. And so, you know, again, one of the reasons for the book is to be at least a little bit of a voice of like, okay, here's what I think, you know, here's how you need to understand these things, right? The, to try to provide some of that videographic kind of commentary on these vids um, to make them understandable um, to to a, a larger film oriented cinema oriented audience. Um, and I have to say just again, I'm so delighted to have been invited here because it means a lot to feel that people who are interested in cinema, right. Interested in moving pictures, right. See vidding as, as, as part of their world. I, I think it's, I think it's a really important statement really um, to put vidding, you know, not in the mainstream, but as a recognized sort of subculture, right. And an influential subculture uh, in the history of moving images. And that was really my desire for the book. And I have to shout out Peter DeCherney at the University of Pennsylvania. I was, um, I was the Dick Wolf professor of television studies there for a little bit. And, uh, and I had been writing about vidding, um, but I didn't really think it was, I had never thought about doing a book. And it was Peter DeCherney who sort of said, you know, this is a like film, film studies needs this book, like needs to know that, you know, that, that the, the more communities of artists that are sort of documented in the history of filmmaking broadly construed, you know, uh, the better. Uh, and I really thank him a lot for saying that I should do a book. Well, thank you for, for writing it. <laughs> um, and I think one of the things that I so appreciate about the, the book and what you were just talking about is that it also, as you kind of say, functions as this piece of advocacy and you kind of chronicle your own advocacy. Um, and so I think I would be curious to kind of end our conversation asking you about your work on the Organization for Transformative Works, your work related to the DMCA, um, because it's something that I think really affects all of us. Um, you know, on this podcast, I've had the creator of the Twitter account Dancer on Film, who has, you know, had uh, had videos taken away. You know, we talk about video essays that have been struck down and, you know, viral Twitter threads by YouTubers talking about all this labor of love. And now we're seeing platforms like Nebula and things like that, where creators are finding refuge, but there's all sorts of things there. And so I would just be curious to kind of know what kind of work you 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 and the organization have been up to and kind of where looking ahead folks who are concerned about these things should kind of have their, you know, what should, what should be on our radar <laughs> looking ahead? <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's a very good question. Uh, and I do think we're in a little bit of a worrisome time. Uh, there are all of these sort of conversations, you know, many of them well meant, by the way, uh, that are about filtering the internet in one way or another. And I understand some of it. I understand the, com- you know, concerns about hate speech and uh, 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 trolling and racism. I mean, they're, they're, you know, pornography. I understand all of those concerns. Uh, on the other hand, um, having free speech on the internet is really important. Having, you know, places where, you you know, users can, not users, we're artists, you know, where people can be artists uh, and make work and share work is really important. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's really very difficult. And in fact, you know, so much of the work we did with the DMCA uh, was oriented around things like DVDs. But of course, DVDs are increasingly not going to be the way that people are getting their media. Uh, and there is such a push for closed systems. I mean, one of the broad, I mean, the broad, my, my broad answer here is to be pro hackability. And I know hacking is a terrible word, but the idea that, you know, you can customize your, you've bought a machine or you've bought a thing and it belongs to you and you can use it, not just receive it, but that you can use it as raw material. This is a kind of, and, and this is not just video. This is, uh, when we go to the DMCA, we are there with people who want to be able to fix their own cars. Uh, I also have a foot in that world, but, right? But the guys come and, you know, you buy a car, uh, you want to be able to open the hood and maybe soup it up or change the carburetor or put on fat wheels or do increasingly they're making cars 
that it's like, don't touch the car. <laughs> you know, you have to get a professional. To, you just buy a new car. You have no ability to customize or hot rod your car. Um, if you think of vitting as hot rodding your media, right? <laughs> um, which is what it is, right? I'm going to soup this baby. I'm going to cut out those boring scenes. I'm going to drop it and ch- chop it and, you know, put in a new chassis and two tailpipes. You know, you're not being allowed to hot rod your media. You're not being allowed to hot rod your car. You're not being allowed to build your own computer. You're not being allowed, right? Everything is kind of a closed box. And I think it's, and I understand the reasons. I understand Apple wants everything to work seamlessly, but on the other hand, I just don't buy it. I think they want control. They want to make things obsolete. They want you to be very passive in your reception. And so I think any opportunity that you have to fight for the the ability to hack, (laughs) hack your computer, hack to build it yourself, to do it yourself, it's important for the economy, I think, actually, the, 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 the fix it movement. And you can fix a story as much as you can fix a car or a broken screen, all of that stuff, right? That's all on a spectrum, a really important spectrum uh, of, of, of agency. But it's also about skills. I mean, one of the stories, you know, we haven't even gotten to that is another story of this book is, you know, fandom has been one of these places where, you know, women who didn't go to film school or, you know, or, or got MFAs in writing or whatever, learn skills in community, right? We learn skills in community. We learn how to fix carburetors and, and hack computers and build stuff and make stuff. And that's where engineers and innovation comes from. Sampling, right? Um, you know, back to the cosmics research. I mean, of learning, le- I mean, can you imagine a record that you couldn't sample? Where, where the, the whole music industry is built on hip hop, right? Which they then tried to make illegal, which was people <laughs> hacking their records, right? So, you know, and I I think that they try to sell this to you in terms of safeness and convenience and it's going to work so well and don't worry about it. Just hit the operating system. Just hit agree. I mean, if I if I had two large principles, it's, you know, we should be so angry. There's no choice, but it's so angry that we're, we're constantly being forced to agree to terms of service that no human being has read or understands. And right. the only hope with that is that, in fact, that they're unenforceable because it's nonsense that we have to constantly be saying, I agree, I agree, I agree. But that that move of agreeing to things that we don't understand is ter- is democratically terrible. It just tells you that, you know, you have no agency and you should just sign anything, which I think is absolutely, you know, counter to a democratic society. And the second one is to fight to hack whatever it is that you bought and to and to keep some sense of ownership. I mean, you don't own your, you know, uh, this was a famous story of the Kindle, you know, where they sold Orwell uh, and then took it back off your Kindle. Like it turns out you don't really own your, your computer, your software, right. nothing. You don't own it and you can't take it apart. You can't hack it and you can't build it. Anything you can do to fight that movement in culture on any front, like I said, if you don't, if you don't care about vitting, you know, fight it with your car, take your iPhone apart, take it apart and build it yourself, you know, hack the code, learn how to code, all of that stuff. I, I, I feel like that's a, that's a fight worth fighting. It really is. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm have been less of a gamer in recent years, but the trend in video games now of consoles without disc drives and everything is purchased through the Microsoft store and everything like that. It, it's, um, it's terrifying, <laughs> honestly. And what happens? I mean, I don't, I don't know this, but I, I don't know what the history of modding. I mean, you know, people, Used right. to make mo- you know, but really right. creative kind of mods, and now they're sort oh, of, yeah. they'll sell you the mods for a dollar fifty. It's not the same. No, uh, and I just think it, it it's really intended to kind of cut us off at the knees in in so many ways. And and again, even as a learning experience as a teacher, you know, I mean, that's how you learn to do something is by taking something apart and building it and making mistakes and putting it together wrong. If, if we're not allowed to take anything apart, uh, and again, and that includes the movie. I mean, you know, vitters have gotten to be very good editors because they they stu- where does the cut come in if I re-edit right. this sequence. How does it work? How do I make it better? How do I create this emotional effect at this moment? What tricks can I learn to do it? That that learning by doing is, you know, so important. And we're being stopped from doing, which is horrifying. <laughs> uh, it really is. And even, even though it's often meant with, you know, very good intentions, uh, it still is, a, it is a bad trade-off and we shouldn't mm. do it. We should not. And I think that notion of standing up against that is a is a great way to end our conversation. Fitting a history, go download it now. It's open access and free. You, know you don't even have to download. You can read it online. You exactly. can download it. It's an EPUB. <laughs> it's on the Kindle. Uh, yes. It's free and yeah. you can click and you can watch this work. Exactly. Jessica, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. I really, really appreciate it. So much fun. I appreciate <laughs> it really very much. It was great. 